doing a whole how to apply the Word of God series. And really, for Christians sometimes, it's really important. Maybe they haven't heard something, or they didn't know that it could be applied that way. So let's go ahead, and I'll read the paragraph to you, and we'll get into this. Prayer Brings Stability is our subtitle for tonight. Applying God's Word. So in this series, we'll be giving you insight on some practical ways to apply the word in your spiritual walk. I believe many wonderful Christians would enjoy knowing what to do and how to do it, rather than to guess all through life. This will be a fun series, again, teaching you um, some practical truths to apply and understand. You see, we get knowledge we apply wisdom, and we get understanding from the result. So you see, we have been given the victory. How long ago were you given victory? Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus won the victory for you. Now, here's, here's the play what Satan does. He tries to convince us that we're still gaining victories. We're still having to get victory. Now, now listen to how I'm saying that. First of all, Jesus already got the victory, correct? And the Bible says he turned it over to us, and we become more than a conqueror. Right. But you see, if the enemy can get us to think that we have to win our victory, we have to get this, we have to get this, then who's doing the work? We are again. So remember, Satan's a little crafty at switching the horses in, instead of pulling the cart by putting it in reverse and getting them to try to push the cart. You see, oftentimes we try to work a system to get a result when God oftentimes says, pray, believe you receive it, now rest and praise until it comes. Can you say amen? Amen. So praying builds stability. So you and I have been given the victory 2,000 years ago. It was purchased by Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we have the king dwelling on the inside of us. We are in Christ. Do you agree with that? Yes. So what does that mean? So if we're not in Christ, oh, how about we're in the building but if we're outside, then we're not in the building, right? So let me put it easily. So if it says in Christ, you're in Christ. If it says in the building, you're in the building. So we can't overlook some little word in. So also, not only does God dwell in us, but the Bible says we are in Christ. We're hidden in God the Father, okay, so if we're in Christ and hidden in God the Father, what does a thief come for? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So when he comes to tempt us, he's coming to take the victory we already have. Laying the lie which says, oh, you see, you haven't quite got the victory. Because we think as long as we're down here, if we're having any trouble at all, then we haven't got victory. But you say, oh, excuse me, but Jesus said, in the world you're going to have tribulation. But fear not, little flock, I have overcome the world. So where are you and I? We're in Christ, hidden in God. So Satan comes to steal from us. He come in to steal from us. So we should know some tricks of the trade. We should not be ignorant concerning Satan's tricks and his devices, the Bible says. Are you with me? All right, so remember when the enemy is coming at you, the trying of your faith produces patience. Patience because we know who patience is. Can you tell me? Maybe whisper. Who is patience who lives in us? God does. So when you say Holy Spirit works, Jesus it works, say the Father works, all three dwell in you, correct? And you dwell in him, correct? So if Satan's going to steal anything from you, what does he have to do? 
You're in God. You're in Christ. What does he have to do? He has to go through God. You have to, he has to go through. Now, can he approach God? Can Satan approach God? No, he cannot. He was thrown out of heaven. See, I'm going to try to burn out all these quirks we have in our mind. He cannot approach the presence of God. He cannot approach the kingdom of God. He cannot approach heaven. He can't go up to heaven and accuse us. He yells accusations. When you're walking with Jesus, he can't get on the path and slap you in the face while Jesus is walking with you. You see, our mind needs to grasp these truths. That's why we study the word of God, because it begins to reveal to us who we are in Christ and not the lies that religion or maybe something we heard at one time. Oh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, listen, genius. The Lord gives, and the only thing the Lord takes away is your sin. That is, if you give it to him, say amen. God loves to take your sin and give you his righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go on with this now. Listen to this. So go with me to Luke 11. We're going to look at verse 1. The key, brothers and sisters, tonight to the stability of God in our life. Everyone stay stable. God wants me stable. All right, some stable cable. All right. How many here know that if you sit, we sit down in chairs, don't we? But if you looked at a chair and it had only three legs, you'd wonder if that thing was what? Stable. Amen? And listen, if you're looking for somebody to be your spouse, female or male, you want to make sure they are stable. Amen. And when you go to a church that preaches Jesus Christ, first thing, if you're shopping for a church, people do. They're looking for a stay stability in a church. Amen. God wants us stable. We know that he that heareth Jesus' sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he's like a wise man that builds us house upon a rock. Stable. Amen. All right, so you got Luke 11. Look at verse 1. The key to stability is time with God. So if you feel still a little shaky, what should you increase? Your time with God. And if you say something like this, now please don't, don't feel I'm picking on you. Well, I just don't have enough time for God. Uh, please don't say anything like that because it's just silly. Let's move right on. All right, Luke 11 verse 1. Now it came to pass when he was praying. What was Jesus doing? Everybody thought because Jesus is the son of God, Jesus is Jesus, that he didn't have a problem in the world. We know that's absolutely silly. I want to tell you, Jesus didn't come as God. He, he was God, but he came as a man. He's the man Christ Jesus. So he, as a man, has to talk to his father and get his strength and stability and what to do from his heavenly father. So if he has to do it, then you and I should do it. Should you say amen? amen. The Bible says when you pray, not if you pray. <laughs> All right, so now when he was praying in a certain place, when he had um, ceased, one of his disciples came to him and says, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. They recognized the key to Jesus' strength and power and stability was what? His prayer life. Talking to his father. So I just gave you the key. The strongest Christians I know are not the ones that study the word all the time. Are the ones that have a good, strong, habitual, habitual prayer. And they meet with God habitually with sincerity first thing in the morning and then they exchange and walk with God exchanging conversation throughout the day I talk to God like he's my best friend and he's standing right next to me even though he's in me he's also around me so I talk to him he says Lord look at that bird that's really crazy it's sitting there you know I'll talk about something silly like that or Lord I want to be able to match this paint on the floor but I'm not sure about the color. And so what does God do? He shows me by accident, because God 
It's not by accident for him, but it seems like it's by accident by me to mix a little blue with the white. So I had some blue in the corner of my tray and I put the white in there. So I'm doing a gray white on the floor and the blue gets in the gray white and all of a sudden it looks like cloud. And I'm going, whoa, isn't that cool? So God cares about all that. And he said to me, he says, I'm kind of, if you allow me, I will ooze right into the areas of your life that squeak and are a little tight. I'll go in there and kind of smooth those areas out so that everything is covered. And you go, wow, Lord, how did that happen? Well, you know, I did it. God loves the attention. And by us giving him the attention that not only he deserves, but we want to give him, the stability comes to us. Because you've got to remember, what did God say about Job? You get a chance. Your homework for tonight is to read how God spoke to Satan about his child Job, his servant Job. Okay? Even though Job married the wrong woman, his children were rebellious, they were partying hardy, his wife told him to curse God and die. You, I want you to read what God said about Job when the enemy came in. Because that's how God looks at every one of us. Because he looks at us through love and faith. Can you say amen? All right, let's move on past that now. So, he says, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. Three points. Number one, the key to stability Strength and everything we really have need of comes out of the time we spend with our Father. Someone say amen. amen. It doesn't come out of just reading the word or out of just praising. It's the time spending face to face with the Father. Two, the disciples knew Jesus spent time with his Father. The time is holy. Remember we taught you that the word holy doesn't mean faultless. It only, but it means set apart. Jesus set apart time for God. We need to set apart time for God. Well, I give God time all day long. No, that's not what we're talking about. Jesus talked to his father all day long, didn't he? But he spent time face to face with his father. That's where the growth, that's where the stability, that's where the strength really comes. Okay, and then my third point is, I have a, a lady I've told you about before. I'm going to tell you because of those watching and, and tuning in. She was a, uh, a Pentecostal lady, got saved in the 20s in Enumclaw at a mission. When I met her, she was up in the years, but God had laid it on her heart. She had known me through her daughter, who was the, my bus driver when I was in high school. I mean, it's a small world. I mean, I could tell you this story could go on. I mean, how God saved a bunch of my friends and just it was a revival that burst on through there. And I'm sure it was my bus driver, Mary, who was praying for me, and her mother, Beulah. But anyway, they started coming to the church. And Beulah says, God spoke to me and said, I'm to be your intercessor, which means I'm going to pray for you day, every day, in and out of the day as I feel you're on my heart. So you are, besides God, you're my main stay of prayer. I, I didn't know how to take that. It's kind of like giving somebody a Rolls Royce and a million dollars cash. Because when you have somebody praying for you that faithfully, I mean, it is absolutely precious. To, because prayer is one of the most loving tools that we have, most powerful tools. And the giving of yourself to pray for somebody else is, is a loving action. Can you say amen? And see, she would pray. But one thing I noticed about her is while I seen a lot of people, back, back when I had a church, it was huge. Now I've seen a lot of people studying the word, studying the word, but they were having all kinds of problems still. And they loved the Lord and they were doing great things, but they were just seemed to be not very stable. I'm not talking about flaky, okay? And I'm saying, Lord, what's, I can look at Beulah and she never studies the word. It's kind of like she knows it. I don't see her reading her Bible a whole lot. I'm sure she does. I said, but what's the difference? 
I see her stable and these people that study, study, study all the time, not so stable. Comparing the two, she's far more stable than these. And the Lord said to me, stability comes from me. And you have to spend time with me so that my stability rubs off on you. And so she spent time with God and she was so strong and so stable, nothing moved her but God. And so I wanted to pass that on to you that maybe if you increased your prayer time in the first parts of the morning, things would begin to change. Maybe you'd get healthier. Remember last week, what did we teach you? How to apply the word of God. What did you learn last week? Pam the audience, Danny. No, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> okay, see if they know. No. How to appropriate the promises, right? We told you how to do it. So if you're missing finances, if you listen to that, it'll teach you how to get your finances going. Hello. Of course, you were here, so of course, you don't forget, right? <laughs> And if you're healthy, you know, you can believe for your health. Well, let's apply the word of God. Prayer does that. So let's move on. Okay. Hebrews 11.6. Look at this. Hebrews 11.6 in your notes. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. Everyone say amen. amen. Okay. For he who comes to God. See the term? Comes to God. God came already to us through Jesus. Now we need to go to him daily. You need to come to God. See, some people write it off as, well, I came to God and got born again. No, keep on coming to God daily. Why? Because you're not there yet. You are saved, but your head's not renewed. Your body's still out of whack. You're still sickly, still having problems. I'm just speaking generally. Okay? You got to come to God. Then you got to believe that he is, not was. Let me explain. I ask people when they come up for healing. I used to have a lot of healing lines, and people get healed all over the place. We have people still getting healed. But I ask them when they come forward, I says, do you believe God wants you healed? And they says, I certainly hope so. Now, I'm not putting anybody down. In their eye, they're hoping that God will just touch them. Yet the scripture says Jesus died and rose again, and Jesus, by his stripes, we are healed. That didn't say one day we'll be healed. And it says he was wounded, uh, he was, he his own self bear our own sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. I thought that flicked off my finger. I was going, hey, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So you look at that, and you come to God, and you say, God, Jesus paid the price for my healing over 2,000 years ago. I'm coming to you and believing in my heart, confessing with my mouth, and I'm coming to you, and I'm going to dwell in your presence, and Lord, begin to take the word of God and bring help to my flesh. You see? And see, without the prayer being part of that, you're just getting the word. The word needs the water to grow. The seed needs the water to grow and the ground to grow a good heart. You have to have a good heart. That's why Satan tries to make you sour right away. You get saved and then somebody hurts your feelings. And you're sour. Come on, everybody's had that. You're not the only one, Bunky. And we get soured. Get rid of that as quick as you can. The Bible says that even... If it's possible, Satan liked to dig in and plant a root in our heart where we're bitter. It's called a bitter root. By the way, we're going there <laughs> in Montana. No, it's a bitter root, and it says that when you got a root of bitterness in you, if you're not careful, it'll come out in what you say. You'll hear people say, you know, I'd love to do that, but it was their people's fault, and it's because he does that. You see the bitterness coming out? You don't want that coming out. So a way to get bitterness out of you is spend that quality time face-to-face -face with God and let his presence permeate you. Say amen. amen. Are you ever going to get off this subject? Never. Because without God, everything else is foolishness. Even you're studying about God. If you don't have a good dynamite relationship with him, a lot of stuff you study is just going to 
kind of flow to the wind because you won't understand it. Okay, so let's move on. So you must believe and come to God that he is and that he's a rewarder. Everyone say rewarder. 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 That never, those have never talked to him. <laughs> what does he reward? He rewards the diligent that seek him. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everybody wants to know why it's written that way. Well, because it was before Jesus has died and rose again. In the New Testament, it would seek ye first Jesus Christ and his righteousness will promote his favor and grace upon you. would read something like that after Jesus rose again. But still in the Old Testament, it says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness comes when you have Jesus in your heart. And all the things that you have need of will be added unto you. In other words, because God dwells in you, and because you're seeking to love and please God and love others, you are okay. You're operating in blessed zone. And the blessings start attaching itself to you. That's the way it's designed. God is not going to put a blessing on a crab. Hello? He's going to have to wait till you're done crabbing. Put the net away, monkey. <laughs> so the idea is when we get into harmony with God by spending time with him, we're in harmony with the kingdom. We're in harmony with the Holy Spirit. God is able to share things. And as we walk through the day, God begins to do things. It's called the grace of God. And when God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, he was saying, hey, everything that I am should be sufficient enough, Paul. <laughs> Hello, are you with me? Everybody, eyes up here. You're losing me here. Okay, second, first point here. Meeting with God first in the secret place. So I want to talk about the secret place because this is how to apply the word of God. Listen. You've got to know about the secret place if you don't. I've shared a lot about it, but the secret place is where God hangs out. God doesn't hang out anywhere else but the secret place. In fact, some people don't know this, but I'm going to tell you. Okay? God the Father's never got off the throne. God the Father's always been on the throne. Now think about it. If he got off the throne, he wouldn't be God anymore ruling and reigning, would he? So the active part in the Old Testament of God is Jesus. So when you read in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord said, like the burning bush of Moses' time, says the angel of the Lord spoke out of the burning bush, and then it says the Lord said, really the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is Jesus. It's the word. Before he was born in the earth, and begotten of the Father. It was the Word. Hello. When Joshua met the angel of the Lord to battle, and, and he fell down on his face, and he said, and the angel of the Lord, and he asked us, says, are you with me? Are you with the enemy? And God said, because it was Jesus, neither. I'm for the will of my Father. And so if Joshua obeyed the Father's will, the angel of the Lord would protect him or Jesus would be on his side. But if he went against the Father's will, the angel of the Lord would smote him. We see it in the chariots riding hard through the Red Sea. Angels pulling the chariot wheels off so they rode heavily. Hello, are you still with me? So we have this kind of grace, folks. You are surrounded by angelic hosts. Even though you hear me teach a lot about the enemy and how he works, that's nothing compared to what is existing in our midst. There is three to one angelic hosts here protecting us than anything the enemy's doing. The, the key is to understand that is God's a gentleman and he doesn't do anything until he's asked, especially in this planet, nor his angels. You have to ask God, and then he inputs the angels. But the devil's a pusher. He's a thief. 
He's working hard to get everybody to look the other way. Have you ever heard this statement? Don't look here, look over there. Don't look here, look over there. So we've been given the word of God in our time in prayer with God so that we're not taken in deception, that we're not deceived easily, that we walk in the spirit, not the flesh. Somebody say amen. So Matthew 6, look at this. I love this scripture. Verse 5 through 7. Excuse me, verse 6 through 7. Matthew 6, 6 through 7. It says, but you, everyone say me. Notice it says, if you pray. No, it says, when you pray, but you, when you pray, go into your room. This is talking about face-to-face -face with God. Why into my room? Well, it could be the bathroom. It could be your closet. It doesn't matter. But you go into the room and you shut the door. Why? Because it's you and God. You and God, not distractions. You and God. Say amen. Face-to-face. -face. All right. You have a covenant, remember, with God. It's all God and 1% you. <laughs> Amen. So, all right, here we go. So go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in the secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, now listen, do not be... Or do not use vain repetitions as, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their many words. So I took part of this, and I'm going to make it fit today. Have you ever felt like you were praying the same prayer over and over and over again? Well, switch it up. For example, I pray for my nation. Every time I sit down with God and have my time with God, one of the things I pray for is I pray for our nation. Every time I mention it. But I mention it different. Father, I thank you that you're working well in our nation. You're uprooting the corruption. You're exposing these things. And then the next, as the next day when I pray, Lord, I thank you that you're already working all the things that I prayed. And Lord God, guide me as I pray in super, certain areas of state. And he'll start giving you things. So just don't play a, pray a mechanical prayer. I pray for our nation. Thank you for it. Lord, I pray for Israel. Thank you for it. Okay? Don't go into that ritual. Change it up, Lord. You know? Lord, not only Israel, protect the innocents. Don't let those you know, terrorists go in there. Just start letting God guide your prayers. So they're not, you're covering the same basic theme, but you're letting the Holy Spirit give you specifics. So again, the Word of God gives us general instructions, but the Holy Spirit gives us specific instructions on the how-to. Someone say amen. amen. All right, so he goes on further to say, shut the door, who, God who sees you in secret. Now, question, can Satan go into your prayer closet with you? Can he hear you speaking in there? No, he cannot. How do you keep the devil from listening to you? We're going to come. What do you do? What do you say? What do you pray? God, Father in Jesus' name. That's all. When you say Father in Jesus' name, God goes whoom over the top of you. Okay? He, he covers you because you're hidden where? Where are you hidden? See, your mind's doubting. Well, the devil could say, you forget that you're hidden in Christ, in God. So when you get up from your prayer time, you're not getting up in yourself. You're getting up in God. Satan doesn't see you. As soon as you shut that door, boom, boom, you're gone. As soon as you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, boom, boom, you're gone. Complete blank white space. And he's standing there going, Man, I can't wait till they get out of there. I'm going to harass them. See, Christians don't understand that. Because you don't understand that because we don't realize that's what's going on. You don't get the grace of it. You think the devil's eavesdropping. No, he eavesdrops when you're in the flesh. <laughs> but not when you're in the spirit. 
Paul says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. These are contrary. So we present ourselves, we get our charge, we lay our flesh down, we get zapped, bapped, rubbed, everything gets shot into us. We rise up, not within ourselves. We rise up and we stand in God and you make that first step, God's already ahead of you. You got to start seeing that's who you are. Not this other junk that we were taught. You got to put the armor on, make sure your helmet's straight. The only reason why we're given the description of the armor is for us to understand what it is, what it does. It says, but it says to put it on, Pastor Kerry. Yeah, but you go into the chamber and he puts it on you. So putting it on from your standpoint is you going into the chamber and meeting with God. But he puts it on you because it's a spiritual thing you can't handle. He has to handle it on to you. That's how that works. And if you will start doing that so faithfully, your entire thing will start changing very speedily. That's why Satan is always trying to. And listen, he'll do it and, 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 and just laugh. He'll get you so busy and so perpubarated and everything like that. And you're supposed to do something important, but you never prayed first. And your life is just like that. It'll all cease when you do it right. Peace that passes understanding, the love passes knowledge, and the rest. Something Satan cannot touch. And see, it's not being taught. And if anything else, it's going to be taught here. It's not being taught. It's only certain people that I know have taught this stuff. And that's why the church is suffering a lot. Not only that, but listen, stop flipping Old Testament, New Testament. Stop flipping that. Go in there and find out who you are first. And then you go into the Old Testament and pull out all the good stuff and strain off all the bad stuff they did. Amen? And remember, they didn't have Jesus in them. And some did really, really good. You know, I mean, awesome. But many of them didn't. So we can't go, well, I guess I'm going to be like that. And you're studying the Old Testament. You better hope not. You're far more blessed than you realize. So let's go on. A couple points underneath this. I don't preach myself happy. <laughs> All right. So we go in, we meet with God, right? And we don't tell God the same things over and over again. Let me put this out. God told the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. So I'm going to say this. When you go in to meet with God, don't pray in your mind. Please. You want to embarrass God? Go in there and think your prayers. That is not prayer. You go in there and you open your mouth and you let your tongue trip all over yourself and let God cause you to weep and cry. Going in and just sitting there thinking prayers is not power. You have to believe in your heart Confess with your mouth. And if you don't do it, there's nothing moving in the spirit. It's just your head. Now, can God hear us? Yes. He can. Well, why won't he answer our prayer? Because he said you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That's why. God doesn't break his own principles just so he could favor you because you don't know how to pray. Start learning. Okay? Move right past that. So, point one. We know God is with us, right? And we know God is in us, right? So we become wise when we address him throughout the day, right? But this is face-to-face -face time we're talking about. Getting alone with God where we literally become one with him. Going in with such a hunger, you weep before you could even sit down. Because you just want to soak up as much of God's presence as you can. Let me encourage you to do it. Second, God dwells in us, right? He dwells in the spirit, right? So if God dwells in the spirit, that's the secret place. 
This is where the enemy can't come. He can't hear. Why? Because we're in God's presence and Satan has been kicked out and forbidden to get into God's presence. Could you imagine what had happened if he could use God's presence against his children? Well, the very thought of it is idiotic. Satan cannot use anything. Satan cannot create anything but a problem. But he can alter things. Alter your thinking about God so that when you try to follow him, you're going to always fall apart and make a mistake. I got one guy I'd counseled, and he always thought he was just going to always backslide. So he gets saved every Sunday and backslide. Saved because nobody ever taught him that who he was in Christ. Sometimes we get to these step programs, and because we really need some help, all they do is drive the word into you and scare the iniquity out of you. But when you get back out in the world, you don't know the love of God. You don't know the principles. You're just scared. That's not what God wants us to do. And so some people coming out of rehab, a good godly rehab, sometimes it doesn't hold until they really get into the word and they find a relationship of prayer with God. Hello. Moving on. Thirdly, God rewards his children individually. So your rewards are different than mine. But also, he amplifies these rewards openly. Listen, when you pray and you do exactly what we're learning tonight, and you just love God, people are going to see you are called by his name. You are blessed by his presence. You don't have to tell people you're a Christian. They can tell by standing next to you. That's why, pet peeve, why, who in the world gave the church the idea of being like the world? It wasn't God. Hello? And we got these giant churches acting like the world, and the people get saved. But where's the follow-up on them? That's my concern as a pastor. See, I can see you, and I know where you're going. I know how you're growing. You see? That's why I wish you get more people. They just don't, every once in a while, date us. Drop in once in a while. I come on, you know. And then there's some people that come, not necessarily at a smaller church like this, to a larger church, and they're really not there. They're only in their physical presence, but their head's somewhere else. So let's not go there either. God wants us to pay attention, right? It's only our life. <laughs> All right, let's go on. Fourthly, let us look at these rewards. What kind of rewards, Pastor Kerry? Are they in the scripture? Yes, especially the ones promised to us as children of the Most High God. Say, I'm a child of the Most High God. Not the second high God. Not the third high God of the most, most high. God says, I've looked to and fro, and there isn't anyone else. One and only God. The Israelites were made to say, and God is one. You know, he's it. That's it. There isn't any other. There's false gods of wood and hay and stubble, but he's it. So why not hang out with the guy that's it? You want to be on the winning team? <laughs> Get real close to the franchise owner. <laughs> All right. All right, let's go on. Now, uh, so as you read, let us look at the rewards. All right, Psalms 91 tells us. Everyone say secret place. Secret place. Teach me to hang out in the secret place. God is there. I have to take my flesh off and go into the secret place. Okay, here we go. Psalms 91, 1 and 2 to start off with. He who dwells. He who dwells. Not he who visits once in a while when things are going rough. Coming to see God, you know, God, I need a new house. You know, I'm just joking about that. No, he who dwells in the secret place. 
of the Most High God shall abide under the influence or shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. That's a place where you hang out like this property where Satan can't come in here. We've even seen, in fact, Joe here saw a demon try to get in one night, really freaky, you know, and it hits <coughs> an invisible shield or something. It did a whack. Is that correct? correct? All right. I want everybody seeing that I'm not making this story up. Yeah, God shields us. He's our refuge. He's a place where you can camp, rest, and shield. But we got to understand these things and not just say, isn't that nice? God's a shield to me. He's like a refuge. Isn't that nice? <laughs> you see how the devil tries to get us to... All right, so let's go on. He says, he's a refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I what? Trust. Trust, Trust means you believe him no matter what. Okay? Psalms, a little farther down, I, I, I took out some of the stuff. It's all in there. You can read it later. But I dropped down to verse 9 through 13. Listen to this. Because you have made the Lord, and this is the psalmist talking, so he says, who is my refuge, the psalm David is saying, he's my refuge, and you made him your refuge. Even the Most High, your dwelling place. Your what? You see, I dwell in that home across the parking lot there. But I'm all around and stuff, but I dwell in that home. You, God wants you to dwell in God, and then you can walk all around with him. But dwell in God. Hang out. Can you say amen? Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No sh plague shall come nigh to your what? If you're, if you're, you're dwelling. If you're dwelling with God, guess what? A plague can't go into the presence of God. What is this COVID stuff? Plague. It's a plague, whether man-made or not. It's a plague, and with a plague comes a spirit. And if you go back to the plagues during Egypt, they were told to do what? Put the blood on the door porcelain and lentils. Why? So then when the plague came, it passed over, right? <clears throat> well, genius, bless our hearts, we are. Who are you, what are you covered with? You're covered with the blood of Jesus. So for you to think you could catch COVID through the blood, it's the opening probably you will. I'm, what I'm saying is you can take authority over COVID. Now, I'm not saying be foolish, follow some rules, <clears throat> but don't do anything out of fear. But you know, none of us have gotten it. None of us, except for my wife and I, Way when it first came out, we didn't know what to resist, right? But none of us of this church has gotten it because you're taught how to take authority over it. You're taught to dwell with God, and it's God who covers you. It's his blood that pushes the plagues off. Hello? So you might want to try in your prayer time God, I thank you that I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. And if you feel anything odd or weird while you're walking through your day, meeting different people and shopping, whatever you need to do, you feel something a little bit different, just plead the blood, say, thank you, I'm covered, Lord, and rebuke, and suddenly it'll all right, and you'll go, hey, oh, wasn't that some? Because you're walking through with sewage. A spiritual sewage dump. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My throat's real dry. What do you mean, Pastor, a sewage dump? Well, this is Satan's planet. Remember, God is standing, and his angels are standing, waiting for us to believe God and act on Scripture. Right? There's so many more of God's angels here <coughs> than the enemy. But Satan knows that he can get to the Heavenly Father 
through his kids by tormenting them. And a lot of them give him permission, give the devil permission to torment them. They don't pray right. They're, they're mad at people. They won't forgive. They gossip. They do all that. And then when they go to pray, nothing works. Now, you know the answer, don't you? Without me making anybody. Listen, you got to meet with God, and he's straightening all that out. Hey, just because you flip on the radio might not be on the station. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> all that singing. So anyway. And he goes on further. And he says, you shall give his angels charge over you. His angels what? Charge. If you match it up with Hebrews 1.14, the angels are sent forth from God to minister for them who are heirs of salvation. So you are an heir of salvation. You've got your salvation. So the angels are here to minister to you. So if you believe God's word, you confess God's word, you meet with God, the angels work with you and work on you all day long and even over you at night. But if you go, you know, what did Paul say? You go to bed angry, you're going to have nightmares. You don't resolve your problems at night and talk to God, you're going to get visited by some kind of unclean spirit, going to go right on and harass you while your subconscious mind cannot resist him. We're going to deal with that here in a minute. <clears throat> so, his angels have charge over you when you're in the spirit to keep you in all your ways. In their hands, they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone, lest you trip. You shall, uh, you shall tread upon the lion. Doesn't Satan walk about as a roaring, as a roaring or like a roaring lion? He's not a roaring lion. He's as like a roaring lion. Okay? He's a big mouth. So it says you can tread upon the lion. Isn't that interesting? Hello? You tread upon the lion and the cobra. What is a cobra? It's a serpent. Who's the serpent in the Bible? And the serpent, this cobra's spring. They dart out like that. So Satan always... Darts out. You're going along really good, and suddenly something shows up in the middle and darts out and says, IRS wants you. <laughs> or, you know, somebody calls on the phone and it's a fake call and says, There's a discrepancy on your social security card. <laughs> you know, you see what he's doing? He's. <laughs> See, the lion who roars, the cobra, the young lion, those are the most fierce kind. Always young people in the wrong spirit are big mouth and usually have telling adults what they should be doing. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. What does that tell you? Hang out with God. Find the dwelling place. Where's your niche? Okay. It's that time with God. Are you with me? Almost done with you. Our covenant gives us boldness. Everyone say, our covenant. Now, do you remember what I shared with you about the covenant? Remember Stanley? Stanley? Yeah, I remember he went to look for his, uh, you know, Livingston. Livingston, I presume. Remember he couldn't get into Africa? And he had to make a covenant with the largest tribe, the fiercest tribe in Africa. And the guy, they had to cut their hands. And, of course, uh, Stanley didn't want to do that. So he says, what do I do? I don't want to make a covenant with this dude and bleed my hands and rub them together. So his interpreter says, I'll cut the covenant with you. You can pick somebody to do it. Aren't you glad Jesus was picked for you to cut the covenant? Amen. Not only that, but here's a neat thing. He was given... The covenant, and they cut the covenant with the, with the guy, and then the tribesman gave him his, his staff. And this staff meant all authority in all Africa. 
And so naturally, as he began, he started getting resistance. All the guy did is come out and show him the covenant. Okay? All right. But then there was a couple of tribes that wouldn't let him in. They says, no, you can make that up. When he pulled out the, the staff and showed that he had that king's staff, everything was out. And everybody fell down and said, leave him alone. Well, you have God's staff. You have got God's rod. You have God's armor. You have God inside of you. We need to learn, having done all to stand, stand. But not until you first fall on your knees and you get yourself right every morning with God. So when you stand up, it isn't you. It is God you're standing up in. Amen. Satan doesn't see you anymore. He sees the face of Jesus, yeah. the guy that whipped him. The guy that treads upon him. The guy that was prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that said it would be the seed of a woman that would crush and bruise your head. He lives in us, folks. Because of that covenant. Listen to what it says. Hebrews 4.14-16 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. What we say must agree with the word. All right? Hold fast your confession. Okay? For we do not have a high priest who cannot be sympathized. Now I got the hiccups. <coughs> I'm just together. <coughs> who cannot be sympathized with our weaknesses. In other words, Jesus suffered at all points. He was tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore, because of this, come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and a time of help in the time of need. Wow. Think about it. Because of the covenant, we can talk to God at any time, anywhere. But when our face-to-face -face comes, should be first. Why? Because we need to be set. We, we're out of tune. We need to be tuned up. Our flesh needs to be conditioned so that when we get up within ourselves, God can clothe us. Now listen. God cannot bless the flesh unless he pulverizes it first. So if you lay your flesh on the altar, you lay your flesh on the altar, then when you Get up within yourself. God is able to approach you. Hello? Because you're not oozing sin and rebellion. <laughs> well, how did I get all that? All I did is go to sleep at night. Your flesh, have you ever noticed? Even if you don't do any work or anything like that, if you just sat for two days, you know, went to the restroom and ate, but just sat, your body would produce odor and poison because it's fallen. So naturally, we shower, we refresh, right? Well, why, what makes you think we, we shouldn't do that with God? Spiritually first. And then every day afterwards. Huh? You want to smell like heaven, don't you? Not hell. Boy, you smell like hell. <laughs> Who you been hanging around? <laughs> I'm joking. Can you laugh with me a little bit? All right, let's move on. So we can come boldly before the throne of grace. God is saying, come. So point one, because of our covenant cut by Jesus Christ for us, with God our Father, we have access anytime to God, and we can literally be covered and silhouetted by God's presence and his fortress down around us. His angels are in charge of us. My word, how can we live a defeated life? Because we're thinking of ourselves. That's a real tough answer. Because they're thinking of themselves. And when you talk with them, it's all I suffered and this wrong, and my husband's doing this, my wife's doing that, and blame, 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 blame. Go back to Adam. What did he do? God says, Have you eaten of that tree? Oh, it was the woman you gave me, God. You know, the blame, 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 blame. You get all that taken care of, the, 
when you're in that stability time with God every morning. He rubs it out of, he rubs it out of me. Sometimes I get up and things crept in on my mind and I'm dwelling on something I really have, can't really do anything about but get upset. And, I, and God says, what are you dwelling on that for? I says, I sure need your presence, God. Yeah. And then I go, <laughs> you see, because we're creatures of the old habit, but the Bible says take our old habits and kill them. Lay them at Calvary. Lay them down to the altar, say amen, and then finishing. Here's the big key to know, okay? It is a face-to-face time and exposure to God that causes us to grow up out of ourselves. The results we have need to be whatever we might need. I don't know about you, but you have needs that you don't even know of. But you get in there and say, Lord, work on me. Change me. Change me before I do something that might embarrass myself. You follow what I'm saying? Change me, Lord. Because we really want to be loved and accepted by people, don't we? Sure. And, you know, if you've ever been one like myself, been rejected by lots and lots of people, and it wasn't because of my looks, <laughs> just maybe my person, it doesn't really matter. Rejection's a hard thing to deal with. But you know what? When you're walking with God, you're already geared up for whatever junk the enemy can throw at you. You're already pressurized. You're already filled with joy. The joy of the Lord is my what? Strength, right? Merry heart does good like a medicine. So, I mean, don't let your face ever hold a frown on it for more than about three seconds. Really, stick some toothpicks up there. When I was going through all the things I was going through, I was in so much pain all the time. Then I got shingles. And I was in a pain, and the Lord says, son, I want you to just let what's inside of you shine on your face. And all I knew to do was just go. You know, seriously. Until I learned to kind of get that taken care of. And we all go through things. So please, just because, you know, you go through a hard time doesn't mean you're failed at anything. The idea is for a pastor like myself or any other good pastor would tell you, God is the strength. But meeting with God is the one Satan fights you hardest over. Building that time that you're with God. Getting to know God. Your salvation becomes stronger and becomes more enriched by getting to know God. And it takes time to get to know God. You can know him through the word a little bit, but it takes time. It takes time. Amen. When you get married, come on. You thought you knew him? (laughs) You thought you knew her? It takes time to build a love relationship. Come on. And why do we think that we can instantly get up to the altar and boom, 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 bang, bang, boom? No, I'm ta- I've never seen anything like it in my life. Some of the best word that you guys get. And there's other great churches. And those are the ones that Satan doesn't want attended. You can go to the ones that look like circuses. Everything's gone. 20 minute sermon. Wow, wow, woo, woo, woo. We've had church. Yeah. But let me, I talked to a lady the other day, you know. I says, you know, you were taught at that church, you know, put on the armor of God so you can stand against the devil, right? Yeah. So I asked her, I said, say, hey, how do you put on the armor? And she looked at me with this blank stare and said, I don't know. So sometimes we verbalize things and stuff. We know we could take authority over the enemy, but we don't know why. How? How come? A lot of that is handled when you meet with God because he will show you how it works. You're meeting with the creator. All right, let's finish. Please, please, you're over. Okay, all right. So the time with God and the exposure to him will bring about swift godly change in your life. And then we take that change And we let, between us and God, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. John 15, 5 through 8 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, there's that dwelling again. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. 
for without me you can do. So let me just tell you something. If you're not prospering, if you're not getting better at things, you might want to increase your prayer life. Okay? Don't fall under condemnation or feel like I'm picking on you. But listen, oftentimes if there's a deficit in an area of our life, we can make it up by talking with God about it and asking him to step in. <clears throat> you have not because you... <clears throat> Amen. So let's go on. Then it says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out like a branch and withered. And they gather them and know them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire, and it will be done for you. Wow, that's a biggie. Well, you see, when you spend time with God, and you get up from that time from God, and you ask prayer, <clears throat> who's actually praying? God in you is praying. And you, the God, now listen, your spirit man, who lives in your spirit man? Listen to me, this is important. God lives in our spirit, right? So you can't sin from your spirit. But you sin from your thinking and from your flesh. Because it's undisciplined. It's not brought in and crucified like it needs to be. And so we just keep on going and then we'll do something we're ashamed of. And then we'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. And we keep on going. But God wants our walk to be a little more stronger than bobbling around. Right? What's that pool game that you, you hit it, snooker or something like that? You've been snookered where you're banging off of everything all the time? That you'll cure that when you begin to find stability with God. He has to become your best friend. All right, and finishing. So if my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and shall be done for you. Herein is my Father glorified. He's glorified that you would do that. Okay? All right, practical applications in prayer. So let me give you some. Number one, open your day up with what? Amen. God and you walk through your day together. Okay? You don't start with God. You're walking off. He might want to say, woo, back here. Two, learn to wash up before you proceed. What do you mean? How many here have ever made a meal or two? Fine. So when you get up from the garden or... You're working with dumping the garbage, and now you got to go into the kitchen and cook food. What's the first thing you do? You wash your hands. When you're around your family that's not saved, when you're in a situation at work where it's really uptight, when things are little, traffic is enough to drive you wonderful, and you find yourself a little irritated, what do you do? Wash your hands. You simply say, I bind whatever that is, I take authority over it, and I command it to loosen me. When you do that, it'll pop off of you, and a cleansing thing will come over you, and you won't take any spooks home with you. Because some people literally will bring a spook home with them. They'll say, why am I so moody all of a sudden? Moving right on. Thirdly, at bedtime, dump the bag. You guys are a vacuum cleaner. So am I. We're sucking up things all day long. Not all positive either. So at night when you're talking with God, you don't have to spend a big time, but please talk with God. Say, Lord, I sucked up a bunch of things. I'm sure some of it wasn't right. So I dumped my bag. I just cast any cares, any frustrations of the day over on you, any worries about bills or whatever. I just cast it over on you, Lord God. And then... The other thing is, learn to plead or declare the blood of Jesus over your mind when you go to bed. Say, Lord, help me to sleep a sweet sleep. And Lord, I declare the blood of Jesus over my mind and my body so I can sleep sound, Lord, and that I'm covered. So when you do something like that, you keep the enemy from coming into your subconscious. I used to have dreams, terrible dreams. The devil would jump on my chest, and I couldn't talk. And I'd leak out this little squeaky Jesus, and then he'd leap off, you know, intimidating dreams. 
And, and if you're having suffering with some of that, that's just the enemy harassing you. He's a real tough. He has to wait till you're asleep. So the thing is, you plead the blood of Jesus. Remember, you want to place yourself in God's hands. At night, you can't beat the air. You can't smack a devil off you. Hello? But you certainly can cover the night by asking God to watch over you. But I don't know how many Christians will go to bed and not even pray. If it wasn't for the grandmother's prayer, they probably wouldn't, would have a nightmare. So learn to wash your hands when you're around people. Get the fling this stuff off of you. Dump your bag at night. Any cares, any frustrations, give it to God. Cast it over on him. Then plead the blood of Jesus over your mind and over your body to wake up refreshed. When you're praying, for example, the last one I have is number five. Uh, number four. How does the enemy get his power, folks? From us. How so? <clears throat> Bad confession, unforgiveness, gossip, all these things give the enemy inroads. Now, a bad confession one time is not going to let the enemy come in. But you'll listen to some people, and that's all they talk. This, and I've got this, and I've got this problem, and everything like that. I love to sit back and listen to people talk after the spiritual meeting is gone just to see what they clack about. And a lot of times they clack about things they shouldn't, what I mean by their jaws are snapping. Sometimes when you guys are having an afterglow meeting, make sure you're not discussing anyone or anything that you can't help fix. And you really be careful because people are listening, whether you know it or not, and so is the enemy. So we don't want to do anything like that cause us to be in it. And so how do we pray for somebody if they're lost? You know, you might have family members. You might be like me and have people I work with who weren't saved. How do we claim somebody's salvation, put them on the altar and know that they've had it? Well, here we go. Point five. Look at that. Praying for the lost people or family Claim their salvation. Father, I claim John Smith's salvation in Jesus' name. I bind up the demons that are working in his life to try to destroy him. I remove their assignment in Jesus' name, their influences, their inroads. And, 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 and I bind it up against, that come against him in Jesus' name. I forbid them to ever return. So in Jesus' name now, I release their angels to bring them to a place of making a decision for Christ. Stay on them, Lord, until their very dying breath. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you'll pray for people that you love, if you're older, you can go down the phone list. Find people in your, your apartment complex and start praying for them like that. Lord, I claim the Smiths. I claim the Joneses. Lord, you know all about them. I bind the demons from destroying their lives. Oh, now you've done it. You meddling Christian. You've got all the weapons and all the good tools, and you what? Satan's got you preoccupied, so you can't even pray for the lost. So anyway, don't feel bad. Now you know some stuff you can be doing to change all of this stuff. If you got something good out of this tonight, would you give praise?